This is the Camp Iron Mountain Podcast, a place to learn about U.S. military history as told through the stories of service members, military units, and supporting civilians. Join us as we work to preserve their memories for future generations. Welcome back, everyone, to the Camp Iron Mountain Podcast. I'm your host, Gabriel Suarez. Today, we're fortunate to welcome to the show our first guest, Christopher Adams. Chris is a U.S. Army veteran. Enlisting in 1996, he served 13 years on active duty as a communications specialist before being medically discharged in 2009. During his time on active duty, Chris deployed twice to Iraq. His first deployment was to Anbar Province in eastern Iraq from 2004 to 2005, and his second was to Baghdad during the surge from 2006 to 2007. Chris is currently working as a federal government employee at the Veterans Administration. I hope you enjoy this interview. All right, we'd like to welcome to the show our first guest. This is uh, Chris Adams. Hey, how's it going, Chris? Long time no see. Hey, Gabe, how you doing? It has been a minute. Yeah, when's the last time we met each other? And when I was in D.C., maybe a couple of years yeah. ago. Yeah, this was about me. What three years ago? And I was uh. Uh, we had met downtown, and one of my favorite restaurants had a really good time that day. It was really, really great, really good seeing you. Yeah, that that, that was. It's always a blast seeing you. Um, you know, especially when we get to go around the country, and and people we know are everywhere, and good catching up oh, when yeah. we can. Oh yeah, definitely. So just to kind of hit based off of of your story, uh, thanks for being the first guest of the show. Um, you know, the basics. You know, where uh, where were you born? You know, where did you grow up? Oh wow, that's a great question. I'm a I'm a military brat as well. I was born in Michigan, but my father was in the Air Force, so uh, we moved around all over. I, I moved to uh, Spain when I was an uh, infant, uh, and then uh, my parents broke up, and then I we wound it up uh, here in the uh, D.C. area. Uh, and I've been here in the D.C. area off and on since I've been eight about eight or nine years old. So I'm back here in D.C. So is that where you uh, entered? Start you you joined the army. No, actually, I joined the army. It's funny, funny story, funny story. When before I joined the military, I joined when I was 22, uh, and I joined in Georgia. Uh, and like, okay, Chris, how'd you end up in Georgia? I uh, before I joined the military, I I, I uh, worked in apartments, so I had moved down there for a job or whatever. I was down there for the Olympics, and I was bored with my life, and I wasn't doing anything. So you know, as 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 the commercials go, you know, if you're bored, you know, come join up, and that's what I did. And uh, I left from the D.C. area, but I joined in Georgia, Atlanta, to be exact. You said your dad was in the uh, the Air Force. How did how did they feel about you joining? Uh, they were cool with it. You know, they thought that I, you know, give me more purpose and more direction and things of that nature. So, you know, they were all they were all all aboard because, you know, for being African-American, you know, that's kind of like, you know, what we do, either go to college or uh, uh, or we go go to the military. And, you know, my family has gone to the military. Okay. What job did you get when you signed up? Oh, I always I always had the same job. It was always uh uh a communications it was always as always doing the same thing. Uh I wasn't offered one of those cushy jobs like some guys were. So, you know. That sounds like, like a, that sounds like a pretty cushy job. Communication wasn't cushy. No, it was terrible. It was terrible. I mean, and in well, as I should say, not necessarily terrible. It had it had its good point cuz I was stationed here before I moved to before before I moved before I ended up in uh, uh in 19, so yeah, I mean, I was here for nine eleven, you know, so it wasn't as good as as you think it is. So, did you sign up before nine eleven? Yeah, I, I signed up in ninety six, I believe. Okay, how was that feeling when when nine eleven happened? Great question. Um, I felt kind of, you know, I felt kind of bad, kind of proud, and you know, like, hey, this is what I signed up for, you know, let's get it. So, I was, I guess, you say gung ho. I think. For your communications branch, how was training for that? Were you exposed um, in high school or any of your civilian jobs? Negative. No, I wasn't exposed to any any of what I what I did in the military and or, or what I'm doing now prior to me joining the military. So uh, I did just communications. It was it was hot. I went to school in in Georgia, so uh, it was hot there, and uh, it was cool. Cool. I enjoyed it. I learned a lot. Okay, were you part of the IT nerdy guys or the radio guys? No, I was a, I was a radio geek. My uh, my MOS, we uh, we had the opportunity to do both, and I actually did both. But obviously, earlier on, I was uh, just a radio dude, uh, a maintenance repair dude, and in and out of trucks, you know. And then I 
and I gradually trans transitioned into uh, more the on the IT side. But I love radios though. Any funny stories from basic training or AIT? Well, basic was uh, basic was interesting because, like I said, you know, I wasn't I wasn't eighteen. I was like twenty two when I went through. So, you know, it was a little different for me. And uh, I don't know. I think some of the younger guys didn't take it seriously, and I kind of did. And they kind of looked at that. And again, I got promoted while I was in basic, and you know, so I, I was one of those dudes. So I mean, it was interesting. I had I had some funny drill stars. I had one drill star, and I'll never forget this guy. And 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 I hate to say it, but I don't remember his name. But I know he was a uh, he was an ADA dude, I believe, air defense. But uh, I never forget it. And this is I don't know. This is kind of cheesy. But you know, he one of the uh, where did I go to? I went to Jackson, and Jackson at the time was co-ed. So you know, we had females, and this one female lost her gloves. And I never forget it was cold. It was cold that day in Georgia. It was uh, in South Carolina. Uh, and he actually took his gloves off and his hands, and it was cold. And she was, he, he gave her his gloves. So I was like, I don't know if I would have did that. I was like, you'd have to freeze. I'm I'm not <laughs> doing that. I'm like, that's on you. Put your hands in your pocket. <laughs> I'm not doing that. I'm sorry. It's on you. But, you know, so I, I look at that as a, as an inspiring moment, you know, throughout my career, what I did in the military and, you know, what I'm doing at the VA as well. Okay. What was your first duty station out of AIT? Oh, I went to Germany first, and that and that was interesting all in itself. I was in uh, I was in Hohenfels. I was uh, I worked on uh, one of the uh, I don't know if you guys ever been to CMTC before before the war and all of that. But it was a training area before it was more so more woodland training area, and uh, I was on one of the uh, teams that actually monitored one of the I guess you would call those. I forgot, Gabe, what do they call those guys? The the OCT. Yeah, the OC teams. Yeah, I was on the on the repair team for the OC trucks. Okay. So that's what I did. I did that for like three years, and I really learned my job. That was cool. It's cold though, very cold in Germany. Where was your next duty station after Germany? Oh, I came to DC at that. After that, I, I did three years, and then I reenlisted because I did a year in school, and then I did three years in Germany. Then I came to DC on my reenlistment contract, and I was here doing nine eleven. So, uh, and I actually, and, and it's, it's a great rumor, great rumor. And I, and I love the spelling it. People talk about, oh my gosh, it was a rocket. It wasn't a plane. I was a colonel's driver and day of 9-11, they said, all right, Chris, well, like the next day or something, just start down for going down to the crash site. So we, I went down to the crash site and it was a plane. It was a plane. A hundred percent. It was a plane. Wow. What was your duty in DC? I was uh, kind of strange. It was CCP. Uh, we did command group. I guess you wouldn't call it their, their command module. So if we maintained a semi-truck. So it, just in case if there was a national disaster or something stood up, something, some natural or intentional thing happened in the city, we would stand up and uh, we had a semi-truck. We would roll out to the site. And, and I was on the team that we did. We were the retrans team. So we did retrans across the city and all of that. It was because D.C., there's, there's a lot of things here in D.C. that the president has options to. And if he has options, his staff has options. So we all work together. Pretty interesting. So is that how you ended up at the Pentagon after 9-11 and saw yes, the cross yes. site? Yeah. Yeah, because that's what my, my boss. He had to go down there. He had to have briefings and the Sergeant Major and the Colonel. So, yeah, I was always down there. Hmm. That'd be pretty intense. Oh, it was. It was. It was. So from DC, where did you end up next? Oh wow, DC. That's the DC started. Well, actually, nine eleven started my whirlwind tour. I ended up in Korea, uh, going up to one nine, into Manchu territory. One nine is one nine infantry. Yeah, two 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 one nine second uh, second uh, second ID second brigade uh, one nine. So yeah, I ended up there in uh, HHC at the time. You know, did communications uh, for the colonels teams and. Because we they, we had Bradley vehicles and and I, I never really worked on a Bradley vehicle so that was interesting. Bradleys are very small vehicles, so you know bigger than a Humvee was smaller than a tank. Uh, I, that, they were they were very small and and I'm glad that I, at the time I was an E5, so I didn't have the I didn't really have that much to do with them per se. You know I had troops that did, did mm -hmm. all of that, so you know what's one good thing about that. So I, at that point I kind of transferred into more of the IT side at that point. So. That was pretty cool. But it was really strange, though, a lot of alerts. And the thing about it is, you know, not just me. You know, we had guys going to going to Korea, being there for a year and then deploying to Iraq. But that's the whole, that's, we're going to get into that next. Yeah, we'll come back to that. Can you explain to the audience what an alert is in Korea if you're stationed oh, there? 
Oh my goodness. Yeah, that's a great question. What an alert is uh, in Korea. Uh, what it is, is because where we're at, because we were so far north, we were like, I think they say we were 13 kilometers from the from the DMZ at Camp Hovey. And as you all, everybody should know, you know, DMZ is, is, is the dividing between North and South Korea. So they say that this is booby trapped in mine. So whatever, whatever. So as an alert, you know, what we would do is we would stand up as an actual attack is, is happening or as a as planned attack. So at that point, we would get our orders and we would stand up, we would pack out, we would pack out and we would have to load up, load everything up. Because at that time, you would actually have to go to like pre-designated sites and you have to do your, your, your military operations from there. So we never got to that point. We always, you know, ended up doing a, a um, Cherwan loop. What that is is just a show of force that we would do once a month at random times, and this is a show of force at the North, just to show the North Koreans that hey, we're still here. And uh, yeah, it was pretty intense at times because you you never knew when it was, or they beat on your door and you'd hear the uh, the, the siren and you'd like, oh my gosh, is this it? Pretty interesting. So this happened during normal duty hours? No, this was in the middle of the night. It's like two, three o'clock in the morning. I mean, certain I'm sure certain people knew about it, but you know, for the vast majority of the soldiers on the base, you know, no one knew about it. So you would get alerted in the middle of the night and yep. go through your go to war procedures. Yep, you'd have to uh, put on your. Uh, I think you have to get in like MOP three, some some modified version of MOP gear that you had to wear. I think you at least you had to have uh, your suit on and your mask attached. So you know you'd have to have your boots on, but you'd have stuff ready readily near you. Uh, and then you had to put your paint on. Uh, this is you know this is back then we had to wear paint and all of that. Mm -hmm. And then you'd have to you know. Conduct military operations, you know, and battle ready till they gave the all clear. Whether you had to fix a truck on the spot or whatever the case may be, you know, you know, you got to roll, you got to roll. Yeah. So when you guys weren't training or, or doing alerts or day-to-day -day stuff, what was there to do off-duty? <laughs> That's a loaded question. It's a loaded question. Well, for me, I mean, they had, they had like, uh, cause like where I was at Camp Hovey was attached to Camp Casey. Camp Hovey is a smaller, uh, a smaller little, uh, little offshoot of Camp Casey. Camp Casey is a larger base. So <clears throat> Camp Hovey, you know, they think they had like a, they had uh what did they have? They had a restaurant there. I mean, everybody at that time, people, cause we, cause at, at Camp Hovey and Camp Casey, you didn't have cars, you know, so you didn't have cars and you had a curfew. So you had to be back on base. So, you know, you were kind of limited. So what what people would do is you could go to like the town, and what that means is you go off, you could walk outside the gate. They have restaurants, you know, uh, girls, you guys are gonna meet girls. You people go shopping. You can take trips. I mean, it was really cool, you know, just to get out and see Korea, you know, if that's what you wanted to do, mm -hmm. you know. So I mean, it was it was interesting, you know, a lot a lot of guys, a lot a lot of folks at the time they went shopping. They a lot of folks just sent stuff home and all of that. I was never the ones to do all of that, so I was like, look, I'm good. Let me just go eat, <laughs> and I'm good. You know, were you married at the time when you went to Korea? No, I was not married at the time. Okay. But when I was there, it was unencumbered. It was considered a hardship tour because mm -hmm. it was only a year and, you know, you just, you could bring your family if you were married. Uh, but it was, it wasn't as bad as it was like, if you could get past, you know, having a curfew and things of that nature, then, you know, you're good to go. But if you were down South, you know, some of the guys that I did know that were in like Pusan, and places like that, they had it made. You know, they had apartments, they had cars. They didn't go through the same things that I went through the further up north that you ended up at. And and, and obviously there were places further north than I was at. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm, I was just fortunate that I wasn't at one of the more forward deployed places. Can you share with us the story of when you learned that 2nd Brigade was going to leave Korea and deploy to Iraq? Yeah, that was, that was crazy. That was crazy. We were... Uh, it had always been talk, and people had been talking about it and talking about it. Yeah, this unit may be leaving, leaving Korea, you know, going going to Iraq or whatever. And me being who I am, I'm like, well, I'm almost, you know, I'm almost done. You know, I'm almost done with my with my tour. So I'm reaching out to DA. DA isn't answering the phone, or they're not replying or anything <laughs> like that. You know, you know Typical. the famous DA game, the, the the famous DA move. You know. <laughs> so when I finally did get a message back, it was like, hey. We have we have nothing for you right now. You know, you just gotta you just gotta stay where you're at. You know, we'll let you know. And then that's when they came out with the stop loss. At, at, I'm sorry. Prior to that, they had been offering soldiers like, hey, you know, if you want to stay in Korea another year, another six months, hey, we'll give you a bonus. You know, for staying in Korea. And I'm like, hmm. 
let me call DA right now. So I was like, so at that point, I didn't get an answer back. And, and then they, then they instituted the stop loss. And then uh, at, when they did the stop loss, I, I believe they did the stop loss prior to us, them letting us know. So what happened was, it's pretty interesting uh, that you, that you say that, you know, how did we find out? We found out on the news, you know, we were getting up in the morning, going to PT and, you know, emails are going off and people stand around with papers in their hands. And we had came downstairs and got information. My, my captain, uh, Captain Lopez, crazy dude, mm-hmm. crazy. I got stories <laughs> of that dude all day. I gave up. I think you know him too. Yeah. Lopez is off the hook, but he was like, all right, look, we're not doing PT today. Let me find out what's going on. But as of right now, we're not going all right. Sorry. So he's like, so we're like, cool. So then they call formation again. He said, all right, we're going all right. So <laughs> I'm just like, well, damn. <laughs> Well, thanks. Well, thanks, Lopez. Appreciate it. So at that point, you know, first thing they did was they sent us all on leave and the ones that were going. And at that point, and then we came back, then we trained up and it was it was an interesting train up. Then we went to Iraq and drove from Kuwait to Waramani. It was an interesting drive, by the way. So as far as you know, you were the first U.S. unit ever to leave Korea and go directly to another deployment location. Yeah. Yes. That, that from my, my understanding, yes, that we were the... The guinea pigs, you know, I guess they said that, you know, can we do this? And they, you know, I guess they call it one of those heavy lifting operations and they moved the entire brigade plus plus tanks, you know, to uh, another Ford, Ford deployed location. Hmm. Okay, so you mentioned you guys went to Ramadi. Where is that yes. at in Iraq? Ramadi, Ramadi is um, during this time we was there and this was what, 03, I believe. This is during the, I think, the second wave of uh, elections. Uh, this is when West, when we were out West, when it was really bad. This is like uh, prior to Fallujah, and we were there also during the second part of Fallujah as well. So it was it was a bad time when we were in in Ramadi. This is prior to when when Ramadi was really good. It was really bad. You didn't go to Ramadi. <laughs> did you have the same role deployed as you did in Korea? Yes. Um. Great question. I think my role in uh no actually my role kind of uh took off and where's at me where's landing me at now uh at that point when we got to uh, iraq it, they were like all right chris i'm sorry or all right sorry adams this is what you need to do we need to get internet up and everybody needs everybody's needs be, be connected so i took it upon myself and me and my boss i forgot this thing it was it oh gosh i forgot my boss's name i remember claxton was my claxton fallon was my sigo uh and i think oh sergeant turner was my was my NCRC, and uh, I believe that I had help with somebody else. We actually laid the footwork for the internet out there. I had modems, I had computers, so everybody was actually on our on on the internet and able to get out. So even though it was really really slow, I was really able to you know get everybody up online and and get some type of my uh, internet to the world. So you guys were the first unit to occupy this new base. I think we were we weren't the first. I think that we were. Good question. I don't actually. I really do not know. I don't I think. I don't think we were the first. Okay. The what fob or cop were you on? We were on uh, Ramadi. No, I'm sorry. Was that? Yeah, that's Ramadi. Yeah, we were on Ramadi. Can you explain what dangers did you personally face day to day? Did you go out on any patrols? Well, during that time, I didn't. I only went off base maybe a handful of times. I was more so, you know, confined to. Uh, uh, on base, I did a lot of like uh, interior stuff, like dealing with internet and and things of that nature, and more so base operations, not necessarily outside the wire. Um, more so, it was just uh, shelling, you know, just mortar rounds and things of that nature. Not 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 so much more of a. Uh, uh, obviously, when you're on helicopters, you got you know the fear of getting shot down. Not so much being on the road per se. A couple times, but not a lot. Do you have any uh, interesting stories or funny events you care to share? <laughs> there's so many, there's so many. I was just thinking of some as well. Uh, I had, because this just lets you know the level of the stuff that they had me doing. They had me, uh, we had stews, and some folks know what stews are. are uh, they are uh, secure telephones. And this phone that I had, that we had, wasn't working. So my boss was like, hey, Sergeant Adams, I need you to go to some base. I think I had to go to... Uh, Victory, you had to, I had to go to Victory and get it repaired. So I had, everything was set up, all the, the plans were made. Like, okay, okay, sorry, you got to get on this bird and you're going to go here and then you got to stand around and wait for somebody to pick you up. Never, now, at this time, you know, it wasn't like cell phones or it wasn't anything like that. You know, you just had to go where people said they're going to be at. So 
and I've never told anybody the story of two gays. So this is probably going to get everybody in trouble, but I doubt it. This was so, so, so long ago. Just no names. I was, <laughs> no names. Yeah, I, I don't remember the dude's names anyway. I don't remember what agency <laughs> was anyway. So anyway, we were, uh, I had got there. I had my weapon, you know, I had my gear on. I had this, I had this freaking stew in my, in my backpack. So I'm, I get off the bird. I'm looking around. I'm like, I like, I know about no, no where to call. So then I was, so I found this one tent. This was all Marines there. And these Marines are really weird. You know, I'm just, you know, E5 sergeant walking around. I'm like, so like, Hey, I, Hey, I need, I need a place to stay. You know, I'm like, I have this number, but nobody's answering, you know, can I stay here tonight? It was a barracks. And I was like, they looked at me and like, yeah, you can stay, but you can't have your loaded weapon. I was like, well, what am I supposed to do with my rounds? <laughs> They're like, oh, we don't know, but you can't bring them inside. I was like, this is crazy. So I actually ended up uh, linking up with this with, with this civilian guy, and he was the tech I was working for. And he was like, look, dude, I'm going to say you like this. Says, you can crash here in my spot, and, you know, and in the morning we'll get up and we'll go or whatever. So I'm like, all right, whatever. So there I was on victory or whatever with my weapon in this, in this civilian's trailer. I mean, I, at the time, I wouldn't think nothing of it. I was like, well, okay, whatever. You know, I didn't think nothing of it. But, yeah, it was pretty strange that day. And then coming back, I got lost on the helicopter. Don't ask me how I got lost on the helicopter, but the pilot didn't know where I was go- know where I was going. So we hopped around to base to base <laughs> until I finally got back to where I was going. Cause and and this is just shows you, you know, as an E five that you know, as a signal guy that I didn't I didn't know what I what I should have known as an E five as a as a as a non commissioned officer. I didn't know you know how to read a map per se as I should have. But you know, I, I learned my lesson obviously, so I'm still around. So. I figured out where I was at and where I needed to be, and you know, I, and I, I figured it all out. So, did you get off at any of the wrong spots first? Oh, yes, or? I did. Yes, I did. That was the funny part. I got off at uh, it was a Marine one. It was uh, it was a famous name. I forgot the name of one of the Marine bases, and then I was like, yeah, I, I knew the freak and all that, so I called him up. And I was like, yeah, dude, you're at the wrong, you're at the wrong place. <laughs> it's like freak. So I, so he's like, all right. So I got back on the bird, and they dropped me back off. They were laughing at me. So. <laughs> like typical of an army dude so i was like hey i'm a signal guy what do you expect so <laughs> interesting yeah that was one of many one of many one of many definitely at least you were on the right right side of the country mm-hmm. yes that's that's, not, I, that's another story about that as well <laughs> okay so after after your deployment did you guys go back to korea or what was the plan no no that, that's the crazy part about it is uh after korea i mean after after we after our tour once we left korea they said, they said, all right, guys, pack everything up. We're not coming back to Korea. So literally, we took our entire shop with us to Korea. So what that meant was everything that we brought to Korea, we had to take back to our new location. At first, they said maybe, I'm sorry, at first, they didn't even tell us where we're going. They said, okay, we're going to Fort Carson. So I'm like, hmm, I think that's a bad idea, but, you know, they're not going to listen to me anyway. So where, And where is idea. Fort Carson? Fort Carson is in Fort Carson, Colorado. And so besides all of your equipment you had to bring to Iraq, you guys, I assumed you had to pack up all of your, your household goods you had in Korea beforehand? Yeah. So what they, what they did was they said, okay, since you know you're going away, start sending this stuff home and start cleaning out your stuff, stuff that you're not going to need, you don't, you don't want. So that way, when you did go to Korea, you only took the stuff that you needed with you and the rest of stuff, the rest of stuff that, that you weren't going to take went in a conics, I believe, with your name on it and all of that thing that sat somewhere you know, prior to once we got back. So that was pretty weird. Okay. So when you got to Colorado, did you live in the barracks or did you have to spend time trying to find off post housing or how did that go? Colorado was interesting. Colorado, we ended up, it was a, it was a strange time, a strange time. Cause I, I actually came back early uh, to Colorado uh, uh, and, and part of the advance party to, you know, to try to get, you know, some of my commander stuff that he needed and things of that nature. So and <clears throat> I ended up staying in the barracks. I think my family had came up and it was just it was just really weird being there, you know, because, you know, for the most part, you know, I was still was I married at the time? No, I was I was single at the time. I think my, my fiance, she had came up there, uh, you know, because I just got just got back or whatever the case may be. So it was it was interesting. It was just I think the hardest part was as NCOs, you know, you had soldiers that were, you know, ha- that had not been in country you know, in the States for like two and three years, you know, mm-hmm. you know, when they were in the States, you know, they were, uh, they were in basic or whatever, and they were in, they were in training. So they didn't really get that adult life that, you know, that they wanted. And then when they were in Korea, talking about guys that were, you know, had curfews and couldn't really get out there and do those things. And then from there, you send them to Iraq, you know, with loaded weapons and all of that. And I'm like, 
then from there, okay, you guys have a good day and be back tomorrow at 8 o'clock in the morning. I mean, obviously you're going to have issues, you know. So literally we had everything you can think of under the sun. Every crime under the sun happened when I was there. Wow. When you were in Colorado, your unit went from being an armored combined arms battalion and, and you guys transferred into a, a light reconnaissance squadron. Is that correct? Yes, we went from uh one nine light infantry to a scout unit. We went from infantry to cavalry. So it was interesting. For me, it really didn't change anything. You know, everybody needed communications anyway. You know, just added a couple more options, more HF communications and things of that nature. So you're one of the ones who, who actually stayed in the unit. Some of the others, like, I guess if, if they were tankers, they all moved out, but you remained with the new unit? Correct. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, we were, it wasn't a lot of us that stayed, because uh, I think there was an E5 slot at the time for my job. So they're like, hey, you want, DA said you wanted to stay there. So I'm like, yeah, no problem. So I ended up staying there and uh, staying, I think I re-enlisted for another what, year and a half, something like that. So I stayed with the unit. Okay, so this was about late 2005, I believe? That sounds about right, 2005, 2006. Which unit was this that you guys transferred into it? So now we went from uh, from 2219 to 22361. Uh, As you guys trained up for your next deployment to Iraq, any differences in training in Colorado than what you guys went through in Korea? Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely in Korea. I mean, Korea wasn't, Korea really wasn't designed uh, for the things that guys did in uh, Iraq, even what I did in Iraq. When we got back to Colorado, that's when our training cycle started again. We ended up in NTC, which I thought it was really hot out there. We really didn't, you know, I, I ran a couple of retrans sites, nothing. We set the talk up and things of that nature. Uh, not necessarily, you know, prepares you for Iraq, you know, just different scenarios of things of that nature for, for my team. You guys went to... Iraq again back in, I believe it's October of 2006. Where were you at this time? What part of the country? Uh, we went back to Iraq uh, the second time we ended up, uh, well, for me, it was a little different for me because I didn't go with my unit. I went on a mid team, a military transition team. Uh, we were tasked with, we were embedded into an Iraqi army battalion. And that was pretty interesting. That was pretty interesting. I believe that they were a, a reserve battalion. So as a training team, you trained Iraqis directly? Yes, we were we were directly involved with Iraqi leadership training. As the signal, I guess, liaison for the Army, and my job was to make sure that the signal officer had what he needed to provide to his staff, to his colonel, or his uh, whoever his boss was, information that he needed. So my job was, during that time, just to make sure that he had his parts, his supplies, and uh, anything else that I could help him with as far as automation-wise. And that was very interesting. Compared to your first deployment to Anbar, where you primarily stayed on the base, in this new deployment, you're out pretty much every day, training Iraqis, going out into town. Yeah, and literally in everything of that nature, uh, we did patrols, multiple patrols uh, per day. We trained Iraqis. We did, like, different operations where they needed Iraqi support. You know, we were there as well. A lot of different things of that nature. Any humorous or unusual events <laughs> that happened during your time? Uh, so many different events that happened during that time. Uh, I remember one time, this is more so when we were uh, we were all in the house at the time, because we lived in this giant frat house at the time. And it was uh, maybe, because on, on our team, it was literally like 11 of us, uh, you know, from our boss, which was Major Brace, down to one of our drivers. I think he was, what, a PFC or a specialist, I believe. He was a specialist. And, uh, I mean, everybody played their role. Uh, one day, me being the dude that I am, I, I connected the internet throughout the house. So we were all playing, I think we were playing Halo at the time. And, uh, we were different teams. It was like six of us playing. And it was literally, we had the radios going. So we were doing squad movements over the radio. And my boss, Major Brace, he was on the phone talking to, I think his, his, his boss or whatever. And he was like, hold on a minute. I think something's going on. So he was, he ran into the room. It's like, hey, what's going on? What's going on? I'm like, oh, no, we're just playing a video game. So this is more so <laughs> before, you know, before, you know, all this automation going around and, you mm -hmm. know, playing video games, we had the same thing, you know, way back when. So that was one of the main, one of the funnier things. I had a lot of good times. I met a lot of good people there. I do remember that. I guess for, for the group who didn't know, uh, I also was on the team with, with Chris during this time. Yeah, what, what I remember was, was the officers and NCOs were all on the same team. 
and then all the the junior enlisted were were on a team upstairs and and all I remember is they they had some kind of cheat code because they were kicking our <laughs> all night long and we unleash a whole clip into them and they would never die but one shot and we were gone yeah 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 yeah, yeah. what about your time in combat any close calls mm, well a couple of close calls some were more scarier than others some some were not as funny as others uh, i got two stories for you okay one scared one scared the bejesus out of me one is why i got out the military uh now uh one of the reasons why i got out anyway we were i don't know if you remember this game or not we were doing a search and uh, a search and i made some, some type of court on a search at the air force academy and it was hot that day and uh for some reason prison was like we were like in braces with us on the braces there at the time we're like hey we need to go over this wall so I'm like okay no problem you know so we go over the wall i'm on the other side of the wall Prigion rolls over the wall and falls on me. So I'm like, really, dude? Did you really just fall on me? So Prigion was already, I mean, I was already a big guy, maybe like at the time pushing about with all the weight on maybe three and some change. And Prigion rolls off of there like 280. So I'm like, really, dude? Messed my knee up that day. I was like, really, Prigion? Thank you so much. <laughs> Another one that scared the crap out of me is, um, this was later on in deployment. We were leaving loyalty it was the middle of the night, and uh, we were going back, back to our. We we left loyalty. We we're going back to where were we at, Gabe? At Freedom. Uh, thing at? We were at uh, Shield, Bob Shield. Yeah, we were at Shield. Yes, we were going. We were leaving loyalty, going back to Shield. We had gave some report to the uh, to the boss or whatever, and we were coming back, and we were on this road. This was a terrible road, and we and gave. I don't know if you remember or not, but we we should have stopped that night. We should have stopped that night and and talked to those guys. Well, anyway, we're on this road, and this was a terrible road. This is a road that some guys had got killed on, like when when we had first got there. This colonel, these two colonels had, had died, one leaving, one coming on the same road. And it was the middle of the night, and I was driving the lead vehicle at the time. Me and my me and my uh, me and my TC I think it was Klimke at the time. And I had Klimke, I had the interpreter, and I had a gunner. And it was eerie, eerie as hell. Uh, we were driving down the road, and uh, the other team, which was four, four of the trucks, they all the other ones had fell back, you know, because it was one of those roads like, look, something's going to happen. It's going to happen on this road. Mm -hmm. So we had, so we were riding down the road, and all I remember is hearing Clinky saying, left, 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 left. So I'm cutting the wheel hard left, and like, okay, I didn't, there was nothing out there. So we got off the road. We had, earlier on on that road, we had come to a checkpoint, and this wasn't a normal checkpoint. For some reason, I don't know why we didn't stop and talk to those Iraqis. But they were, I don't know if you remember, they were, didn't have any weapons. They were in uniform, but I don't remember why we didn't stop and talk to them. But that was probably the scariest time, you know, that, that, cause I'd never been struck by the IED, you know, knock on wood, mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, that's one of the good things about that. So, a pretty, pretty scary night that night. Pretty scary night. A lot, of, a lot of scary nights, but that was probably one of the scariest nights. Yeah. Do you remember that night game? Partially. I mean, it, some of them blur together after all these years. Yeah, some of them blur together, yes. But I do remember your first day or being do shot not, at. Do not, do not Gabe. Do okay, not I, talk won't. About that. I won't. Gabe, I won't. Well, Gabe, why do you want to do that, Gabe? I, I won't. That's, okay, I'm just saying we we're, we're on the same truck. I'm like, just go ahead and say it now. I mean, you, you don't you, open the you, door. You were pretty. Open, uh, literally, uh, literally, open the door. I mean, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, I, no I would just if you don't if you don't want me to, I don't have to. I just, <sighs> it's seen if you still remember that. Obviously, you do, which is good. Obviously, I do. <laughs> Obviously, I do. So, so, so the story is, since Gabe has, has so nicely brought it up and it was pretty embarrassing. I have a couple of embarrassing moments, but this is pretty embarrassing. We were, uh, this is our first move to contact. And I think this is, I think a lot of the guys first time getting shot at, it wasn't my first time because I was, you know, I had been in Iraq or whatever prior to that, but we had gotten run the radio that, you know, your surgeons were setting up a roadblock on type of ambush or whatever. So we rode by there we and we rode by there and they shot our trucks up. And, you know, I think the first time, yes, it was the first time, first time it was me, I was a driver, I had a gunner, and I had uh, uh, my captain in there, and Gabe was in the back the, with the medic. The medic sat behind me, and my truck got shot up. I mean, literally, my truck got shot up. And when I say that, literally, they, the glass broke on the, the windshield. They say that it uh, bulletproof and shatterproof. That's not necessarily a true statement, because it, <laughs> it blew back on me, and, and surprisingly, I didn't get cut that day, because literally, there was glass all in my neck and all on my shirt and everywhere. But literally, I had lost my mind for some reason. I was cursing, and it was Gabe. I Gabe's gonna. I'm not gonna say it now, but 
I was like, I was like, hey, you know, let's cut down the road. You know, let's go light them up. <laughs> let's get out of the car and you know, let's get out and then let's go do them. You know, that was my mind. You know, and in the middle of the bullets hitting the truck, you wanted moving. to open the door and go after. Yeah. Them. <laughs> yes, I wanted to get out and shoot them. Yes, <laughs> yes, I did. Thank you, Gabe, for for bringing that up. Okay. I didn't. No one knows about that, but now everyone knows about it. That's okay. We all have those moments. I'm sure more moments will come out later on. I'm I'm waiting on your moment. So. <laughs> I have some stories as well, so we're we're good. Okay, we're I good. think we're running out. Of- <laughs> <laughs> what kind of friendships and camaraderie did you take out of of serving during this deployment? This one more so than more so than my first one. There's just a couple guys that I talked to. Maybe one or two guys that I talked to for my first deployment. But my second one though, it was. It was different because, you know, it was more so I was in combat and, you know, I was there with these guys and things of that nature. And I think that, you know, that we've just built bonds. You know, I can reach out to some some guys right now and, you know, and like like nothing. I can reach out to Gabe and, you know, comes to town, I rap to him. You know, sometimes I reach out to uh, the stewards and see how they're doing or things of that nature. You know, some guys I still do talk to and some I don't talk to, but that's cool as well. You know, we were all there for the same reason. You know, that's the same reason to get back home. Same way we got there. So we did that. Well, for the most part. Mm-hmm. Grace lost a finger, half a finger, but you know. When did you leave active duty? Uh, I left active duty October 2009. And how was your transition back to civilian life? Oh boy, Gabe, it was pretty hard for me, honestly. I'm not going to sit here and lie to you. Um, when I left Carson, I ended up, you know, they reached out and said, hey, what do you want to do? Do you have options? You know, I'm like, I have options. You know, they really don't say you have options, but mm-hmm. option one and option two. <laughs> yeah. One. So, I mean, they really didn't. I mean, they gave me three options. So, this is either I can be a recruiter, drill instructor, or instructor at the schoolhouse. I'm like, hmm, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. I'll be the instructor because I knew I didn't want to go on a trail. Those are things that those long hours and things I did not want to do. Going on a trail when you go being a drill instructor, I mean, because it's more of a lifestyle that you need to do. So now I didn't want to do that. So I ended up at Carson where I first came in at as an instructor. So, I mean, that was interesting. You know, I taught a lot of officers. I taught OBC. So that was interesting, you know, teaching officers about my experiences and things and things that they're going to see and things they're going to do, you know, some of the challenges they're going to have. Um, I got out and uh, it was tough for me at first. You know, I didn't have a way, I didn't have anything to do. You know, I got out because of my knee. I had a couple of job offers. I actually had a job offer to be, to go back to work for uh, some contracting company. I forgot the name of it as an instructor, but I didn't want to do that. I mean, they actually flew me out there and I, you know, I aced the interview. You know, but the one thing about that is if your mind isn't there, then regardless of whatever the case may be, you know, you're going to get in trouble or you're not going to do what you need to do. So my mind wasn't where I needed to be. So. It took me a little, a little while longer to get my traction and get going. But what I did was I got out in Georgia. And then from there, you know, had some struggles around Georgia. And then I came back to D.C. Things kind of evened out, you know, eventually, you know, I got a job at the VA. So uh, that was that's pretty cool. And that's been where I've been at since 2011. Between 2009 and 2011, I had a couple odd jobs. And I had a job as a contractor with the State Department. That was pretty much sitting in a little box at night. I didn't like that. And then mm-hmm. I got a job at the VA. And that was cool. So, And I've been at the VA since 2011. That's great. Final question. What would you want our listeners to take away from your experiences or those of the people you served with? What I would take away from it? Um, I joined the military, you know, to, you know to, make a, to make a better way for myself and my family. And by doing that, I knew the inherent risks and joined the military at that time. I knew that in the average about maybe 10, 10, 15 years, you know, there's usually a conflict. And I came in after Desert Storm. So and this was prior to 9-11 and leading into Desert Shield and, and all of that and all of those things, you know, Iraqi freedom. So I was I came in there right in the middle. So I knew there's a chance that I could be doing something like that. So, I mean, it was a risk I, I knew that I had to take and I, I wanted to take and it let me down some great roads and meet me some great people. Uh, I have great experiences. I have a wall full of full of plaques and pictures on my wall now. I'm looking at pictures and folks that I I see. I have a picture with me and Josh Klimke uh, sitting in the uh, in the palace. Mm-hmm. I mean, who else, who else has a picture of that? You know, sitting in the palace taking a picture on one of Saddam's couches. I do. So you know, a lot of experiences that I did gain. You know, a lot of things that I do have. And this is only a chapter of my life. 
I'm here for it. Chris, thank you very much for being my first guest. I definitely look forward to hanging out again next time in, I'm in D.C. No doubt, no doubt. We can hit, hit a restaurant up, grab a bite to eat, and, you know, and hopefully by that time, whether it's 22 or 23, you know, things will be definitely different, and we can uh, do some things. Well, I appreciate your time, and thank you for joining me, my friend. Thank you, no problem. Anytime. If you like what you've heard and would like to support our podcast, please subscribe and leave a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast player you're listening to us on. The positive reviews help others find the show. Please visit our website at campironmountain.com and subscribe to our email list. On our website, you will also find the links to join our private Facebook group and other social media sites. Stop by and leave a comment, ask questions, or provide ideas for future podcasts. Join our efforts to preserve the important memories of our veterans and civilians for future generations.